Life isn't easy. We all have moments of struggle, hopelessness, and despair. The day-to-day -day can begin to take its toll. And before we know it, we're consumed, overwhelmed by stress, surrounded by fear, unable to see the light through the darkness. It's no wonder we lose our joy and forget what peace actually feels like. But there is a way, a way for hope to break through our walls, a way for our faith to be renewed, a way for comfort to surround us. We can once again feel the light shine brightly on our face. We can experience the warmth of God's love and watch the darkness be overcome. For it's in the light of Jesus we find peace. Well, hello. You guys doing all right? Very good, very good. Okay, very good. We're, we're doing a series on, we're working toward peace, and the concept is called take, take a Deep Breath, and we're doing some mental health stuff. We're taking some time, taking what the Bible teaches us about mental health and peace and those kind of things. And some of the messages on this series, which is going to take probably about six, eight, seven weeks, um, some of the messages are going to be rather light, and some are going to be kind of heavy. Today's heavy. Let me just tell you right up front, this is, this is a heavy message. Um, the topic is heavy. We're not going to talk that much about r bad things, I don't think. But it is, it is challenging because we are challenged toward mental health. It's not something that comes easy. Peace is not something that we just get rolled out. We talked about there's no, there's no peace fairy. It goes around just sprinkling peace on us. There, there's processes we have to do, things we have to do if we're going to get there. And today we're hitting something really, really a, a big, it's a big deal. We're going to be talking about shame and guilt today. And th those, those are significant issues, especially in, in, our, in our culture, in our community. They're big deals. And let me just, first of all, let me clarify what guilt and shame are. I'm just going to jump right in. I hope you don't mind. I'm not going to tell you some interesting, cool story. I'm just going to start talking, okay? And so shame and guilt, we're talking about shame and guilt. Guilt is the belief that we have done something bad. Frequently we have done something bad, but sometimes it's just the belief. Because occasionally you do something that's not bad, somebody tells you it's bad, and then you believe them. And you've got guilt that comes from that. But normally you've done something bad. But shame is the belief that we are bad. That deep inside there is something terribly wrong with us. And it's something that we then struggle, as we'll see, to hide, to keep away from people. Because we don't want them to know about our shame. Okay? Um, guilt has to do, as Harold Sinkbell says, guilt has to do with behavior, while shame is a matter of identity. Shame becomes who you are, okay? So let me, let me talk a little bit about some ways where shame comes from, okay, where, where we might get some shame. Um, on a very light, because everybody's got some shame, but on something that's not as bad, but one that you, you can all relate to a little bit. Um, you guys know who Clancy Brown is? Probably not, unless you're a real movie buff. You don't know who Clancy Brown is, but you know Clancy Brown's face. Clancy Brown is a character actor. He was in uh, Shawshank Redemption, which I hope you've all seen by now. And Shawshank Redemption, there's a, he's, he's the mean prison guard. He's the head prison guard. He's the one who almost throws Andy Dufresne off the roof. Okay, that's Clancy Brown. Clancy Brown is a very successful and accomplished character actor, which means nobody knows his name. Everybody knows his face. He talks about that movie that he was flying to the set. He's flying to where they're going to film the movie. And on the plane, he is convinced that when he gets there, he's going to walk onto the set and they're going to say, I'm sorry, we wanted somebody else. You are not the right guy. Go home. And all of us sometimes have what's called imposter syndrome. And there is a shame there that we don't belong. I, I grew up in one of the poorest counties, the poorest regions in America. And Friday, I had lunch with somebody at a golf course dining room. Anytime I go there, I'm like, they're going to figure it out. <laughs> they're going to ask me to leave pretty soon, pretty soon. It's, gonna, it's not going to be long. They're going to go, excuse me, sir, that's not, you don't belong here. And all of us have a little bit of, survi of not survivors, of, um, that, that idea that we don't belong where we are. Now, that's a mild version. There are extremes, other extremes, the other extreme, um, is someone who was abused as a child 
and they're going to carry that with them. And that, that's a heavy, heavy thing. And a lot of times when somebody's abused as a child, there'll be uh, the, the grown up, who, the grown up, quote unquote, who's doing this will constantly tell them it's their fault. And that they're the, they're the problem. It's not, it's not the adult's fault, it's the kid's. And they grow up with this ins insane amount of shame that they have to figure out what to do with. And it'll shape their entire lives. Um, we're in a military community. And a, a, a lot of times, there is a, a, a guilt. There's small and big. And there is a, a shame. Because um, when you were over there, you did things. And then you come back, and you're at a choir event at an elementary school. And all these incredibly normal-looking people are sitting around you. And there's a tendency to go, well, if they knew what I did, they would reject me. They, 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 uh, they would not allow me in this room if they knew what I'd done. And one thing that complicates that is... Um, I say this frequently, that one sign we live in a fallen universe is sometimes you're confronted with two choices and they're both wrong. And for most of us in everyday suburban life, that never actually happens. But if you're in the military, it is not that uncommon for you to be confronted with two choices and they're both wrong. And that's when I will tell you, that's where the guilt comes in. Sometimes there's actual guilt from that because you did something wrong and you have to remember, we just confess your sin. So that's something that a lot of people carry is that little bit of shame from that. But then even bigger, I think usually bigger, frequently bigger, um, as you come in every week, you see there's a flag and a cross over there on the side. And that's, that's actually a memorial. I don't know if you're aware of that, what that's over there for. That's not just because we like crosses and flags. That's more we had, a, um, we had a member of our church named Sam Harrison. And in 2014, Sam was killed in action in a firefight. And Sam was a really nice guy. This is not one of those, you know, sometimes somebody, after they pass, everybody says really nice things about him. This is not the case. He was just a nice guy, great husband. You, you liked to know Sam. Sam was somebody you, you wanted to be your friend. Not because he had airs. He was just down to earth, great guy. He'd been like an all-American football player. But he was just as down to earth and as good a person as you know. And I believe probably there were people who were in that firefight with him who came back home and weighed the scale and said, Sam's not the one who should have died. It should have been me. And they carry a shame. We, they, we call it survivor's guilt, but I think most of the time it's survivor's shame. It's a shame that I'm not worthy. If there was a scale, somehow I should have been the one because he was a better person than me. And I'll just say, there is no scale, there is no fairness, there is no justice in those situations. And people come home, but they come home with, with, with shame. And so we carry shame. Almost all of us carry shame. For some of us, it's not as heavy as for others. But everyone carries some shame. And it can get really heavy. Like, this is Diane Langberg who I read a lot in getting ready for this. She's counseled trauma, counseled trauma victims for 50 years, everything from Rwandan genocide survivors to World Trade Center cleanup people. If you name it, she's been there tr counseling and training how to do it. And she talks about people who are sexually abused. And she says, in my work with victims of sexual abuse, I've often encountered those who have not looked at themselves in the mirror for many years due to the burden of shame they carry. And Sinkbill again says, that's the way shame works. It cripples and shrivels the soul, burdening the heart with an intense and overpowering sense of disgrace and dishonor. And so shame is something that we carry. And in our community, I am sure there are many here in the room, many online, who shame shapes you. The people around you may not know it, but shame to some extent is shaping you. And I want to look at a, an event in the Bible, one of the Bible stories, that deals directly with shame. It's 
it's a story I use a lot, but I usually don't use it in this way because we're going to look at the fall, Genesis 3. I talk about it all the time because it's part of the big story of the Bible, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And it, it's a huge part of that. But today we're going to look at the people. We're not going to talk about it as far as big arc of God's work in history. We're going to talk about two people, okay? And so let me, let's, let's get a run at it by going back just a little bit, talk about Genesis 1, where God says, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So everybody, including Adam and Eve, are made in the image of God. They have an intrinsic worth and value because they're made in God's image. And it even says in chapter 2 that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no, what's that word? No shame. They were shame-free beings, right? And then you know what happens in Genesis chapter 3. Everybody knows some of, you know, we've got the serpent and the fruit, okay? And then it says, in, going into 3, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Shame. And this is pathetic, in a sad way. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Shame. Shame shows up, and they want to cover it up. And they make a very pathetic, honestly pathetic attempt to cover up their shame with fig leaves. And then, look at this, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid. Because shame makes us hide. For sometimes it's hiding completely, for a lot of people it's hiding a portion it's taking a part of our lives and hiding it, keeping it away from the sight. And we, Diane Langberg again, when we feel shame, we cannot tolerate being seen. And so we are stuck. We're carrying around shame and we just want it to go away and it won't. And so we hide it. And there's, there's four ways that she mentions that we hide the shame. And the first is to withdraw. That's where you detach from people. Um, at one extreme, that's buying a cabin in Wyoming and going away from everyone else. In another, it's just taking that part of your life and making it so no one can ever get near it. You, you don't talk about it. You don't acknowledge it. You don't admit it. It is something that is just far away, and you withdraw from people with that part of your life. A second way is to, you d diminish yourself. That's the person who believes they deserve the things that happen to them. You've all seen the, um, seen and you probably know, usually it's a woman who is in an abusive relationship and she gets out of the relationship and what does she do? Finds another bully abuser. Why? She believes that's what she deserves. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that's for every case, but frequently that's what's going on. The person believes because of their shame that they deserve to be shamed, and so they go places where they will be diminished. They hang around people who will bully them because that's what they think they deserve. That's all they think they deserve. Another way is through avoidance. We'll deal with shame through avoidance. Um, a lot of times that's the um, self-medication. Um, I see it. And I, um, it always makes me sad. I'll go to a grocery store, food line, or Walmart, or one of the grocery stores, and I'll come in at at five o'clock and there'll be some guys coming home and in uniform and they stop or some gals and they buy a 12 pack and they head back home and I'm reasonably sure in most of those cases if it's a Tuesday night that the point is to go home and drink enough to create enough numbness that they can sleep through the night and then do the cycle again not everybody uses alcohol some use drugs some use video games some will come home and they just turn on the video games and play until they're so tired they can sleep and they sleep through the night. Um, another way that people avoid it, though, the shame is kind of the exact opposite, is that instead of um, numbing themselves with stuff, they wallow in shame. They'll just continually do shameful things, just go all out. 
all that almost narcissistic, look at me, look how bad I am, look how terrible of things I'm doing. And what they're doing in that case is there is the one shame magnet, the shame anchor in the center of their soul, and they're covering themselves with other shame so that you can't see the bad one. They're doing all these terrible things, not terrible, terrible, but bad, shameful things to distract everybody from looking at the, the real one, the one that to them is the problem. And the fourth thing, I'll just give you the list, is to attack. And that's the bully. That's the one who feels the shame and instead of accepting the shame or dealing with the shame, just pours it on everyone around them. That's usually what's going on with the bully is they're just pouring shame on everybody. And so we got these two people, we got Adam and Eve, and they have been shamed. And what I want us to look at is not as much their shame, I want to look at what God does in response to their shame. Because they are, they're wearing pathetic fig leaf garments and hiding from the God who made them and loves them. And what does God do? It says, the Lord God called out to the man, where are you? Where are you? And the man answered, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And here's the thing. Did God know they were naked? Did God know they were hiding? But he pursued them. And when we have shame, what we want is to be left alone, but God knows that's not what we need, so God pursues us. God comes to us in our shame. John chapter 3, a great verse about Jesus, says Jesus, God did not send his son Jesus, God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn its people. He sent him to save them. He sent them in the middle of our shame to save us out of it. Okay? So God pursues us, and then God does something very, very, very big. He comes, and he looks at them, and God pursues us, and then God sees us, which is the thing we don't want when we have shame. Some of us have our spaces divided up, and there's a room over here. That's where we keep our shame. That's where we keep that event that we don't want anybody to know about. It's over in a dark room, in a closet, in our psyche, and we don't want anybody there. And God goes over and looks in the room, which is terrifying. Diane Lomberg says, God's response is astounding. He comes and asks, where are you? He's in essence saying, I want to see you. You don't want to be seen. You think you don't deserve to be seen. You think if, that if you are seen, you will be rejected. And you're afraid for God to see you, but God wants to see you. But what does he do after he sees? He sees, and then he forgives and accepts. He's not coming to condemn. Remember, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world. He could have done that from heaven. Condemning is easy if you're God. Right? Lightning bolts, earthquakes, ground opening up and eating people. Easy. Accepting and forgiving is hard. And he comes to the man in Genesis 3.11. He, he says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree I commanded you not to eat from? First thing he does, he confronts their guilt. Okay, here's where you sinned. We need to forgive you for the sin. And the only way we can have that is for you to confess it. So I'm going to ask you the question, what did you do? So you can tell me what you did, the, the guilt part of the process, so you can be forgiven. And then God does something awesome, crazy, wonderful, spectacular, unexpected. In verse 21, it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Um, did God need for them to have clothes? Was, was God like, <laughs> I've got to cover you up? No. In his eyes, they haven't changed. Okay? From, from, any, from any person who's viewing them from the outside, they haven't changed from when they were naked without shame. But now they've got shame, and God doesn't harangue them for the shame. He doesn't harass them for the shame. He doesn't condemn them for the shame. He treats their shame. He makes garments so they can have peace. It's not about God. It's not about God at all. It's all about them. 
Now, if we're talking with God and dealing with shame and dealing with guilt, of course, the place that we, we naturally need to go is to the cross. And I want to read you just some out of Luke. I want to read you some of the cross narrative. And I want you to see what's going on at the cross. It says, when they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified Jesus along with criminals. Along with criminals. What's it, what happens to you when you're forced to people that are bad? Shame. One on his right, the other on his left. Jesus, of course, jumps in. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They're trying to shame him. He's forgiving. They divided his clothes up by casting lots. Now, just as a reminder, you, we know this and don't like to think about it, so we don't deal with it. But all the pictures we see of Jesus on a cross, he's wearing a little loincloth. He wasn't. The point of crucifixion was as much shame as it was torture. And you shame someone by stripping them naked and hanging them where everyone can see them. And this is a reminder. They divided up his clothes to remind you he was completely exposed. They were shaming him as much as they could. And the people stood watching and the rulers sneered at him. Shame. They said he saved others. Let him save himself as he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. Shame. The soldiers came up and mocked him. Shame. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Shame. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. Shame. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Shame. And if you think about Jesus' life, it was a life covered in shame. They just poured shame on him his entire life. Remember, he was born of an unwed mother, and people talked about that his entire life. Told him he was illegitimate. He came from Nazareth, one of his disciples. When they first found out who Jesus was, they said, oh, he's from Nazareth. And the disciple who to be said, does any good thing come out of Nazareth? Shame. He touched lepers in a culture where if you touched unclean, unclean people, you gained their uncleanness. You gathered their shame. He hung out with women, and women were not considered, you weren't supposed to do that. That would make you unclean, and then the crucifixion was about shame. But it says in Hebrews 12 that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame couldn't stick he spent roughly 33 years on earth with people throwing shame at him and none of it could stick he's going is that what you got is that all you're not shaming me okay and then it says he endured the cross scorning at shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God he went right through shame to glory now let me, let me finish. I've, got, I've only got four things that I'm talking about what God does to shame. One is he, he pursues us. He sees us. He forgives and accepts us. Let's go back to that look at verse that Hebrews 12, 2 again. There's one thing I didn't show you that I want you to see. Hebrews 12, 2. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning at shame. What was the joy? What was the joy set before Jesus? You say, heaven. That's my, my first response. The joy is heaven. Jesus had been in heaven. He'd been with the Father in glory from eternity past. And if he wanted to go back, he could have. There was absolutely nothing preventing Jesus from going back to heaven except his desire to fulfill the Father's wishes. That was the only thing stopping him from going back to heaven. He could have gone back to heaven any time at all. He did not have to go to the cross to get to heaven. The cross was a detour for him. It was a way off his path to getting him to heaven. What's the joy? The joy set before him. You know what the joy is? You're the joy. We're the joy. The joy set before him was the fact that if he goes through the cross, he can take us with him into glory. I'm right, aren't I? All right? And I can't see you. You've got to talk out loud. Am I right? The joy is you. Whatever shame you're feeling, the joy is you. Jesus looked at the cross and said, I need to go through the cross to get you to heaven with me. 
and for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So God pursues us, he sees us, he forgives and accepts us, and then he honors us. Which is the opposite of shame, right? The opposite, the opposite of shame is glory and honor. And Jesus comes and he's going to honor us. Honor me, honor you. In spite of whatever's in that back room, the shame room that we don't tell anybody about, he's planning to honor us. I mean, I'm not making it up. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed in his image with ever-increasing glory. In case you missed the glory here, let's repeat it which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. God is glorifying you. You're, you feel shame. God is dumping glory all over you because Jesus endured the cross. He endured the shame. He rejected the shame. He triumphed over the shame. And now he brings you and me glory. My favorite verse Kenny used it earlier, but I wanted to save it to now. Such a powerful verse about how God wants to bring us glory and lift us up. You, you, you don't think about it. You read Psalm 3 3. You, Lord, are a shield about me, my glory, my glory, and the lifter of my head. What's that mean? What's the body posture of shame? This is shame, right? This is shame. What's that saying? God comes in two fingers under the chin, lifts our head so we can look him in the eye. I didn't make that up. That's what it says. That's what God wants for you. God wants to take your shame, transform it into glory, lift your eyes so you can look at him. Defeat the posture of shame in your life. He wants to turn your shame into glory. Now is the part I don't like. Not because it's bad. Because what I want to do, I'm, I'm the optimist, I'm the rah-rah guy. Like, I, I like to do the, the triumphant finale and we all run screaming from the building, pumping our fists. Yeah, that's what I want to do. <sighs> Doesn't work. God's, God's capable of immediate healing of all the pain in our life, but he rarely chooses to do it that way. Hardly ever chooses to do it that way. Because he could have done it with Adam and Eve. He could have walked in and just declared it. But notice, what, remember what he did? He said, who told you you were naked? Who told you you were naked? Do you think Eve wanted to answer that question? Do you think she wanted to say, oh yeah, I was hanging out, and Satan came by as a snake, man. It was really pretty cool. And I, and I surrendered to his temptation, and I ate the fruit, and I gave it to my husband. It was great. Do you think she wanted to share that story? How would she share that story? Right? Head down. Shame. But this is, this is you got to hear this. He made her talk. Because, and, I, and I'm speculating a little bit theologically, but we are Im image bearers. We're made in the image of God. God is the word, which means God is verbal, and we as his children are verbal creatures. And the path to our healing almost always emotionally runs through words. Our tendency is to bury the stuff. Bury the bad stuff. Don't talk about it. Don't say anything about it. Hide it over here in a box. Bury it. Healing comes through speaking it. That's why Jesus said, I mean, why God told them, who told you you were naked? James even covers it a little bit. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so you may be healed. Confess, speak. Speak the sins, speak the shame. Say it out loud. Then it says, after you've confessed, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power produces wonderful results. I really wish I could just get you to rah, 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 out of here, fixed. 
I also wish that you could just come up to me and, and tell me what it was and you'd walk away healed. I wish that. I, I really do. But if you have a deep-seated shame, you've spent years burying it. You've spent years building defenses around it. It is probable that if you have a deep-seated shame, your spouse doesn't know really what it's about. Your best friends don't know about it, not really. You may have, you may have created a cover story. You ever done that cover story? Where you can tell enough without telling the real story. You just, you just, you just, you just gloss over it real fast, give them, give them a piece, but don't give them the story. And healing comes when we speak it. And I'm going to be really honest. For somebody who's really, really traumatized, I'm not equipped to hear it. Because there's a process. It requires an insane amount of patience. Usually things get worse before they get better. Because you've managed to put, you've, you've, you've covered that thing up with layers of concrete. And when, we un, when you dig it out, all the emotions come pouring back out that you've buried. And the only way to heal is to get those out. And I'm not equipped. I'm not trained. I'm not trying to brush it off. I, I had one time in my life, a person um, came to me and insisted on talking to me, and I could not get them to talk to anybody else. And we walked through this process together, and somehow we stumbled to where that person found some victory, and then I passed it to somebody who actually knew what they were doing. But that, that, was, an, that was just somebody who had no, it was, I'll never do it again. Because I was very fortunate that we both got out of it okay but there are people that are trained to do that stuff to help you speak and that's where the healing is that's where the glory is I know, I know, it's, I know it's really cool to be strong and silent it's also very painful to be strong and silent remember we started out we talked about the peace the stool where we have peace comes because we have emotional and spiritual health and there's the pieces that support it one of them is friends people you build enough trust to tell them enough um, I have a, a an expression I use called holding a corner because um, when for whatever you do especially if you, but a pastor has a lot of it people tell you things they share their secrets with you and you can't tell anybody and sometimes the things you're trying to deal with the stuff you're processing the all the problems you're facing can get really heavy and what I found is I find a problem I'm dealing with and I don't display I don't give away any confidences but I will give somebody who I trust a corner I'll just tell them a little bit about it and they don't think that much happened but I just got some relief because I just handed somebody a corner but some of you probably need to start by having a friend you can give a corner to I'm not saying you come in and just dump everything on them because they're not equipped to handle it either and you're not ready to give it the right way yet. If it's something deep and heavy, you're not ready yet. But you can give them a corner. And maybe some accountability. And say, hey, can you, can you pray for me that I get the help I need? Can you pray for me while it's going on? Can you ask me if I'm doing it? That's incredibly powerful. Having a friend will say, have you made the phone call yet? And then counsel is where we bring in the person who actually knows what they're doing, who knows to handle it, how to handle it when those emotions start to crop up, when things get worse before they get better. I know you preferred, you would have preferred, I would have preferred uh, the, the rah rah, let's go. This is the path. This is the way. How God makes it work for verbal creatures like us. But we have to dig down, develop enough trust speak the truth to someone who knows how to help us process it so that he can bring the healing and as he brings the healing he brings the glory he brings us back our honor 
the honor that was taken away, often by someone else. We, a lot of times we didn't do anything to bring about our shame or we did hardly anything to bring about the shame. But it's just as real as if we'd done it ourselves. So I'm, going, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm going to challenge you because challenge is the right word. I'm going to encourage you. If I've been talking to you today, if when I start talking about the room with the shame in it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what you've been carrying. I'm going to encourage you to do two things. Number one, I want you to I encourage you to find a friend you can give a corner to. Some friends you can say, hey, I, I'm carrying some stuff. Would you pray for me? And second, I want to encourage you get in touch with us and we'll help you connect with somebody who is qualified to deal with these situations because God doesn't want you to have shame God wants you to have glory he doesn't want you to have shame he wants you to have honor and I don't want you to have shame I want you to have glory I don't want you to have shame I want you to have honor your friends your family they don't want you to have shame have honor so I encourage you do the things you need to do take the steps get that friend to hold a corner get into either get in touch with somebody you know who can do it or get in touch with us unless that points you to the right direction because for the joy set before him the joy of you Jesus endured the cross scorning its shame now it, it's possible quite possible that the step some of you need to take first even before the friend thing is you need a relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who lifts your head. You need a relationship with him. And if you don't have a relationship with Christ, what we do here is we just encourage you to grab a blue bag. There are little planters around the room. And if you grab a blue bag, we'll connect you with somebody that's trained. It'll take seven to ten minutes. They'll unpack the bag with you and show you how to have a relationship with Christ. You may need to get baptized to announce it you're a follower of Christ, let us know. We'd, we'd love to do that. God knows about your shame. He was there when it happened. And instead of shunning you, He pursues you. He sees you. He sees you. He forgives and accepts you. And He plans to bring glory to you, to bring honor to you. That's his goal. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that you are fully aware of our shame. Thank you that you don't reject us because of our shame, but you pursue us because you know we, we need you. Father, thank you that you see us as we are and love us anyway. Thank you that you offer forgiveness when we confess. Thank you that you accept us. Thank you that you lift our heads. Father, I pray for the ones who are listening here in the room or online who need to take some big steps. I know it's probably scary. Help them to find a friend to hold a corner. Help them to find a trained person to help them take the next steps. Father, help them to go into those rooms. Speak the trauma. Receive the healing. Help those of us who may not need that to be supportive, encouraging, loving, accepting. Help us to be the kind of people that the ones who know us know that if we saw their shame, we would not reject them, but would love them. Father, heal. Heal. In Jesus' name.